I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. <laughs> Just what do you think you're doing, Dave? Why, you stuck-up, half-witted, scruffy-looking nerf herder! This means something. Charles! Charles! I am Locutus of Borg. I must not fear him. And fear is the mind killer. Get away from her, you nerd! Nerd! I'm Matt Kressel. And I'm David Mercurio Rivera. And, and this, this is, is Nerd, nerd Count. Count. Hello, and welcome to episode six of the Nerd Count podcast. I'm Matt Kressel here with Mercurio David Rivera. And today we are going to be talking about writer's block, inspiration, procrastination, and motivation. So, I, I don't feel like it, Matt. Yeah, you know what? Maybe we'll do this tomorrow. Uh, I, you know, I got some Netflix shows I need to watch. I don't know. And, I got to uh, read about the New York Times articles today about uh, whatever's going on with the unemployment figures. Um, I got to fold some laundry. <laughs> you know, I might want to clean my house, do some dusting. I haven't dusted in a while. Makes sense. Makes so, <laughs> so uh, I think, you know, motivation and, and procrastination is, is a big thing for, for a lot of writers I know. Uh, so... Uh, how many how many people have you heard say, you know, I want to write and I have a great idea and I'm going to write this book and I'm going to, you know, how many everybody that I've ever spoken to has always said I am going to write a book, and yet how many really sit down and do it? Um, there, you know, it's tough. That's I think that may be the, one of the toughest things about for some people. Uh, uh, it's the it's definitely work. sitting down and doing it. You know, it's definitely work and and. Uh... You know, interesting that you brought that up because there's a recent article by Ted Chang in The New Yorker, and it's specifically in reference to um, generative AI. And the implication there is that the idea is the most important thing and not necessarily the writing. That's not what Ted says. That's when someone says, I have an idea, but you can write it. It's as if the idea is the most important thing and not the actual execution of it. But Ted makes a a very good argument that it's the execution, the intention, the thousands or maybe millions of little choices you make when you tell a story that that is what makes it interesting and, and worth reading. Um, have you ever but, been approached by somebody to say that, to say, I have a great idea and you just need to Oh, yeah. It? Yeah. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, relatives. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people don't quite understand how much work it is. And I think even even beginning writers who get into it uh, oftentimes don't realize that, you know, like anything, it's it's a skill and it's something that you have to work at. You know, uh, if you want to be a superstar basketball player, no one expects on day one that you're going to, you know, be the best player in the world. You might have some innate talent, but you still have to to work at it. You still have to put the practice in, put the effort in. Uh, no one expects that, you know, the con a concert pianist is going to be a master the first time they sit down at the keyboard. But why is it that people assume that because you're a writer that you just have an idea that all you have to do is then sit down and write it? it in practice, it turns out to be, you know, a lot harder in some ways. And certainly talent, I think, plays into it. I, I think that there are some people that, yeah, they, they have more talent, uh, natural talent than others. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the old adage, you know, 1% uh, inspiration, 99% perspiration, I think applies. I think that, um, you know, uh, sitting down at the keyboard and, and working at something every day, days, weeks, months, years, uh, is really what what you have to do if you want to write, and it's work, it's ass work, and it's difficult work, and it's it's um, you know people look at someone sitting at a keyboard, sitting in their chair, and staring at a screen, and like how hard could that be? You're sitting down all day, you're sitting at a desk, but 
you know, I find that after a writing session of three, four hours, like I'm mentally exhausted, you know, like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I feel like I've put my full energy into what I'm working on. And then, you know, I need a break for a little while. Yeah. Well, you know, when you, when you use the word ass, I thought, of, <laughs> I thought ass. of a French perspective, man. What a, what a segue. Chris, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Chris Dykeman had always, had always said, uh, cause you know, people complain that they have, they have writer's block. They just, you know, they don't have any ideas. They just they can't do it. They can't, can't execute, can't write. And what she always said was, well, there's a, she has a, a simple cure to that. And that the cure is get your ass in the chair, ass in ass chair. In chair. <laughs> yeah. And uh, she, she has a point. She has a point about that. A lot of times what seems to be, um, you know, this block that you can't get through, you can kind of write your way around it. You sit down, yeah. you poke at your keyboard, you, you do exercises, start writing. And the next thing you know, you're past it. Uh, it's pretty remarkable. Okay. Yeah. My grandfather, who I never met, I heard this from my father, but he called writing ass work. Mm -hmm. um, but um, Stephen Graham Jones has a, uh, a good philosophy about it. I read it in an interview that he, he said that, uh, you know, a plumber doesn't get to decide that he doesn't feel like plumbing that day, right? He doesn't wake up and be like, well, you know what? I don't feel like going to work today. It's like, no, you, you go to work every day, whether you want to or not. And that's mm -hmm. how you kind of have to treat writing. You have to treat it like a job. And some days you're going to sit there and you're going to be inspired and the words are going to be flowing. Mm -hmm. And some days you're going to sit there and it, it's going to be like, you know, staring at a brick wall and you're like, what's going on? And you just seem like you're pecking away at it. Yeah. Is, 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 that, I mean, is that, I mean, I've always heard, I've heard a, a contrary view about um, that once you start looking looking at your something you love to do yeah. as, a as a job and you you approach it as a job, then all of a sudden that can lead to, uh, you know, a reluctance to want to do it because it's, it's, it's work. And if well, you, sure. you yeah. have to do it, then maybe you don't want to do it. Um, what do you think of that? I mean, I, well, I, I think it, I think it's important to like have fun with it and, mm -hmm. and, what I describe as fun is like, it's, it's different from like, I don't know, going to see a movie or, you know, playing a sport or something, doing something fun or going out with friends. It's different kind of fun because it's, it's, it's a, it's an effort. It's work. It's like a work. Uh, yeah. But when I, 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 when I, I like the sports analogy actually, Matt, because yeah. there it's like, well, you're actually, that's well, sports is work, right? You have to actually do exercise. You have, you have to, to exert, but yet it's fun. It can be both. It's, yeah. And and I think for me the the fun comes from getting into that flow state. Um, so there's this the way I describe the flow state is like when you're operating like you're operating at the liminal space between your conscious and subconscious mind. So it's like you have a conscious intention of where you want to go but you're letting your subconscious guide you for like the next phrases or steps. And I find that if, if I, if I sort of hover my awareness right at that level, not only do like the words flow out more easily, but I have so much fun doing it because it's like, I feel like my subconscious is coming to life. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's really important uh, to sort of work in that zone, um, especially with, with first drafts. Um. Yeah, and you know, you know yeah. I, I mean, uh, our our friend, our writer friend, Elia Don Johnson, refers yeah. to it as her her fugue state. Fugue states, yeah. You know, where she sits uh, down, and the next thing you know, she just she just spends. Uh, she, she's a real prolific writer, and she like you, Matt, and she um just pumps it out. She gets falls into that trance, and you know, hours pass, and she just produces a lot of work. It's very impressive. You know, I think, yeah. that we, by the way, I think yeah. that you and I are, are very different um, writers. And um, so I think this this will be a really interesting discussion because for for me, um, I mean, I admire the fact that you're able to to sit down every day and you get your writing in and no matter, it seems like nothing in life stops that for you. And uh, that's why I think that you're what I, I always said, you're a true writer. Nothing's going to stop that. And for me, I, I do think that there are things that get in the way and um, I tend to be more uh, deadline driven something yeah. is due and then I sit down and then I force myself 
I force myself into that fugue state, but but otherwise, you know, my my difficulties lie in getting my ass in the chair, so to speak. Um, right. So well, um, like Stephen King in on writing talks about like the faucet philosophy. Mm-hmm. He's like, some days you're gonna sit down and you're gonna write and the faucet is just dripping, you know, two, three drops at a time. Mm-hmm. And some days you're gonna sit down, the faucet's gonna be spewing out gallons of water. But mm-hmm. if you don't sit down at all, you're never gonna be available for the faucet to flow. Mm-hmm. And and the other thing too is like, um, you know, your brain is neuroplastic. You know, um, people have told me that. Yes, no. <laughs> so, yeah, your brain is made of plastic, David. It's it's made of uh, what's the, what's the plastic that's in everyone's body, like credit card size plastic every day or something. Um, but the what I'm saying is like, you know, think of muscle memory in terms of like when you're typing on a keyboard. Most people listening probably have typed on a keyboard, and then you know you're like trying to type out one word and then another word comes out. You're like, wait a minute, I didn't mean to type that, but my fingers kind of went their own direction. Mm -hmm. Um, Or are you just not even looking at what you're typing and you're just sort of typing it out and your brain is telling your hands what to do, but you're not really conscious of it. What's happened is your brain learned, your brain was neuroplastic, your brain learned how to send these signals to your hands. And I think the same thing happens with with writing is like your brain learns if you write every day at the same time, your brain learns that that's the time for this type of creative thought. And so I find that, you know, you know, thank you for saying that, that I, I write no matter what. I don't think that's true. I think that sometimes life gets in the way like anybody. Mm-hmm. Um, and then some days, you know, because I, I, I work from home, I'm self-employed, but some days I have to go into manhattan for a client or whatever and i'm on the train i'm on the subway at the time that i'm usually writing and i noticed this when i started my writing the same time every day was that all of a sudden um i'm on the subway and all these ideas start coming into my head for cool things i could do with my story i'm like why is this happening right now oh this is the time that i usually write and my brain is like this is your writing time i'm gonna write even if you're not at the keyboard and I was like, oh, okay, I see what's happening there. And it's like, um, I, I think that's why I think habits are really, really important. I think if if you wait for inspiration to strike, you're going to be, um, you're going to be disappointed with the amount of uh, stuff that you actually get on the page because inspiration will only take you so far. Inspiration yeah. is not going to be there every day. It's just not. You know, it's funny you were talking about when you're in the subway and you're sitting there and, and you're unable to write that you get ideas to write and you want to write. Uh, because that happens to me sometimes in two situations. One is when I'm in the shower. Mm-hmm. I'm just not, I'm just sort of, my, my mind is just kind of floating around and I'm thinking, oh, this is, I think I get I get story ideas I want to write. Uh, and also when I'm on long drives. Yeah. I think to myself, man, I really, I wish I could write at this moment. Um and then once, of course, once I get to my destination, then I, and I, and once I have the ability to write, then it seems like that feeling goes away. Um, so a good, so a good point about getting into habits, uh, which I need to be better at actually. Um, but, yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that you're right about inspiration and, and that um, I've heard that many times, like, oh, I'm not inspired to write. And you're, it's, I think it's a big mistake if that's what's driving uh, the writing, waiting to be inspired. And have you, has anybody ever asked you, and this is a, this is such a common question that I'm sure you've been asked hundreds of times, where do you get your ideas from, Matt? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, they, all, all the time, you know, people ask me, like, uh, family members uh, mm-hmm. or, you know, people, where, where do you get your ideas from? And it's like, you know, anywhere, everywhere. Um, sometimes I'll get inspired by something that i've read or i've heard but but like you know when i'm when i'm actually sitting down and like working on the individual thing ideas will just come from like my subconscious you know um i i think it's important to expose yourself to things that you're not normally exposed to i think like and I think you spoke about this, Dave, like 
you know, you, you travel, I think you travel a bit more than I do, um, that when you come home, you're always inspired, right? Yeah. You, you come home, you always have these great ideas. Mm-hmm. And, and my theory is that it's like, your, your brain is exposed to these new experiences. And those new experiences are like, inspiring, but it's also like, teaching your brain other possibilities, let's say. So that's why I think it's important to like seek out new experiences, you know, like, hey, you know what? I don't normally listen to this genre of music. I'm going to listen to it and see what happens. You know, uh, I don't necessarily want to see this movie, but maybe there's something interesting in here that I'm not, you know, that, you know, I could learn from you know, read necessarily like, I don't just read science fiction, fantasy and horror. Like I actually read pretty broadly, like just, you know, straight up quote unquote literature and nonfiction and like, um, you know, even something as simple as like when I, you know, if I walk to the gym every day or every other day, instead of going to the the same path, I take a different path. Or, I, or, oh, there's a little park over there. I'm going to go sit in the park for five minutes. Like exposing yourself to new experiences, I think, helps your sort of brain to uh, absorb and acquire uh, new ideas. Um, yeah. And also talking to people, right? Oh, absolutely. You know, you, you talk about travel. One example I can think of is a trip that I took to the Galapagos Islands. Mm-hmm. And when I was there, the, the tour guide showed, uh, told us about the... Um, um, I'm trying to think of the birds, the ones that fly over the ocean um, for days at a time. Um, and the albatrosses. The albatross, the al- yeah. Yeah, the albatrosses, that when, when they're sleep, when they're when they're flying for days over the ocean, half of their minds go to sleep. And then the yeah. other half it takes care of the navigation so that they don't crash into things. They can continue flying over the ocean. And I thought, that is so bizarre. And of course... Um, it made me think immediately of, you know, what would what, what would an alien be like if half of its brain was asleep and half of it was awake in this matter? And I came up with a with a story, "Dance of the Cockaroons." A great story uh, about yeah, about uh, but thanks about um, alien like alien avian avian aliens. It's funny that subject keeps coming up. Avian aliens, who um, yes, when 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 humans encounter them, only half their minds are awake, so they get one impression of the aliens and then once they fully awake to get a different impression of the aliens but that's an example of just a strange idea uh, prompting a story idea and, i mean and i, and I agree with you, by the yeah. way that it comes it comes from everywhere um yeah you know so many different um science articles political articles um uh, the insight you know uh, i'm trying to think of like uh, reading i read, once read an article about snakes how they yeah. were able to smell miles away blood. Wow. And they, they can just, they, they, they have the, the olfactory senses that, that are that fine-tuned. They can smell blood miles away and, and go to where that is. And again, yeah. I thought of what if aliens communicated that way through scent? And, yeah. uh, and then I wrote the scent of their arrival with my scent communicating aliens. Um, so yeah, yeah come from That's- everywhere. Yeah, I read a story in a science magazine that um, they theorized or a scientist theorized that it was possible to um, like during the collapse of a black hole, they theorized that it's possible that the matter or energy inside the black hole might actually enter another universe and and it might transfer. It might be possible to transfer information from our universe into the into the new universe um and uh so that inspired my story the uh the history within us Mm. um where they're basically trying to escape a decimated galaxy by uh going through a collapsing black hole but they don't know if they'll ever survive because you know information can't pass once you pass the event horizon um but you know, how about, how about your story, the, the Sounds of Old Earth? That was actually with you when inspiration struck. Yeah, that actually has a fairly <laughs> mundane, I don't know if mundane is the right word, but we were we were at, at our friend's wedding in California. We were in a hotel and we were watching a documentary about the tearing down of the old Yankee Stadium and 
putting up the new one. And, you know, I know you live in the Bronx and my father grew up in the Bronx and I, I had been to Yankee Stadium, the old one, many, many times. And it was kind of heartbreaking watching them tear it down. But then, like, you see how people were so excited about the new stadium and it was like just this this feeling of losing something uh precious just to build a new one uh that inspired the sounds of old earth which is basically you know i, I scaled that up to the actual earth itself where the old earth is you know it's been environmentally decimated and they're literally chopping it up like they're they're literally pulling you know, they'll take, they take a few things from earth that they want to save, like the, the pyramids of Giza and the Great Wall of China and some other things. But like this guy lives in a, a small town in upstate New York, um, New Paltz and on an historic street, the Huguenot street. And, uh, you know, it's not important enough to save. And he's lived there his whole life and his family's lived there for generations. He doesn't want to let uh, it all go. And, you know, there's a little frog pond in the back of his house and, uh, you know, and it's basically uh, how he uh, has to let go of this old thing and and move to New Earth. Mm. And, uh, yeah, it, it, it super, actually... Super, super poignant uh, story. Um, and it's funny what inspired it. Um, yeah, you know. it's inspired by, by that. But, but you know... I want to just say, though, that sometimes stories are just inspired by, like, we don't know where they come from, right? Have you ever had that experience where something just comes into your head and, like, that would be mm -hmm. cool, and you don't know where it came from? Yeah, that's true. That's true. You, you know, like I, yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna say that uh, you talk about um, the act of writing itself sometimes creates ideas. That's true. I, I, in my experience, I find that when I'm sitting down and writing, I usually have come in with the the MacGuffin, whatever the, the central idea is of the story. And that usually comes from, for me, from, you know, sometimes it pops into my head, but other times it comes from these outside sources. This is just the central idea. And then the act of writing helps me with plot twists and what if this happens and what if that happens and the story goes in different directions. Um, so, but, um, but yeah, it is, it is funny the, 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 where ideas come from. And sometimes it's inexplicable, as you said, they just pop in. Um, you know, I have another example of, um, of uh, watching once a it was a CNN report on the uh, the war in Africa between the um, these the Hutus and the the, and the the Tutsis and how there was genocidal war going on. But yet after it was, you know, the government was trying to bring the the parties together and they created this this massive government project where uh, they were building houses and uh, members of both tribes were compelled to work together. To build um, houses, and and the, the story in the CNN report was about a woman who actually wound up building a house with the man who had murdered her own family. Wow! And she, it was really I, I couldn't I was really intrigued by this because the the woman was telling her story, and by the end, she said that somehow in her heart she was able to find forgiveness for the man who had committed you know, such a terrible atrocity, and she didn't. She said she didn't know where it came from. The forgiveness, but that um, she gave credit to to God that that somehow her heart was was able to you know to to accept that what this man had done, um, uh, forgive it even, um, and uh, so I thought to myself, and I, I actually got teared up li listening to her story, and I thought to myself, anything that makes me react emotionally that way, right. that's a story. That's a story. So I, I turned that into, a, again, a, a human alien encounter uh, under similar circumstances where my protag has to find a way to forgive the aliens that had decimated her, 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 her world. And, yeah. and, um, and again, it was, that was a hard sell. It was hard to, to write that story because it's, it's hard to convince the reader that, that it's possible for the protag to experience that. And it's not, it's no answer to say, well, it happened in real life. I mean, that's never, that's never an excuse. Your writing has to stand on its own. So, uh, but that was a challenge, but that's another example of if something moves me, then yeah. that's a story. That's a story. Generally, I find that if things move me or move the writer mm -hmm. and the reader is moved as well. Um, what was that Charlie Kaufman movie? Well, I won't, I don't remember the movie name, but um, 
I will say that, you know, if I'm around people that are super fascinated about something, even if it's not what I'm fascinated about, suddenly I get interested. So mm -hmm. for example, growing up, I had a friend who was really into reptiles and snakes and I hate snakes. Like I, I'm, I don't, I'm not like Indiana Jones or like, oh, why does it have to be snake? <laughs> like, I'm not like that, but it's like, this. I have no desire to have a snake as a pet, but this guy had, you know, a bunch of snakes, some of them really big, like Burmese pythons and uh, a bunch of reptiles in his bedroom. <laughs> And, uh, you know, when he got really into it, I was like, I got really, I got really excited about it for a little while. And then, and then I was like, what am I doing? I don't, I don't have any interest in this. It was just sort of like interest by osmosis. And um, I think the same is true for, uh, for writers. Like if, if, if the author is really feeling something, the reader will feel it too. And that's, that's the great power of writing. Like the, the, the empathy, like we can put ourselves in, a, in another's shoes and, and feel what they're feeling. And I think that's that's the power of, of good good fiction. Right. Um, but we were talking earlier, you mentioned, you know, writer's block, right? Um, have you ever experienced it? Writer's block? Um, well, you know, usually when, uh, usually when I sit down to write, um, yeah, uh, Sometimes I, it's not that I'm blocked, but that I, like, I don't know what to write. It's more like that I, I, I get distracted. That's more, that's more, my, my, my issue is more about uh, procrastination. Distraction, yeah. Distraction rather than writer's block itself. Um, yeah. You know, cause, because I, I do think that once you start just typing the words, even mm -hmm. if it's just nonsense words, um, then you, you start, you know, you start, um, you start in a direction and you start writing. You can, you can get around the writer's block just by the, the sheer act of writing. Um, of course, I am, as you know, an outline driven person. Yeah. So um, a lot of times when I sit down, I already have something in mind. So I, I'm probably not the best example of somebody who has writer's block. Um, so I'm thinking of like, <clears throat> I have some friends who have gone to Clarion and I know people, the, the Clarion workshop, and they come back. And some of them don't write for like a full year and some of them never write again. And when I speak to them, when I've spoken to them, it's usually like, oh, you know, I, I don't want to write shit. I, you know, I don't want to write something bad. And what it seems to me is that, you know, they they got all this advice from all these pros and they took it to heart. And then when they sit down at the page, they're just filled with anxiety because it's like, what if this is shit? What if this is bad? And, you know, this pro writer told me never to do this. And this pro, pro writer told me never to do that. And and then they're sitting down and then they get frozen or they or they never sit down because it's too, too anxiety producing because it's like there's so much uh, self-doubt there, I guess, in it. Yeah. And um, I th so, I've, had, I've had that. I think you, you probably have too, where... You, yeah. Sometimes, sometimes you, you're coming off of a really strong story that you've written, and you can't yeah. wait to sit down and write the next one. And you're like, I don't think I can write anything that good. And I don't think I'd ever write. Yeah, I, I think I told you that <laughs> early on with one of my very early stories, mm -hmm. and uh, I said, I don't think I'm ever going to be able to top this. And you're like, Yeah, you will. And I'm like, I don't know. Um, and and I think I did. Um, but so for me. Like if I get to that point where I, I can't, like I have too many vo internal voices or I feel like a weird, sometimes it just manifests as like a weird knot in my chest. And like, and, and, I, and I think oftentimes it's just anxiety in general that, that can block me. Uh, but I, I found, um, there's a technique that uh, Julia Cameron, who's the author of the morning pages recommends. And it's just, uh, you take a pen and paper, do not type, get away from the computer, sit down and write three pages freehand of train of thought, whatever comes to your mind. Do not edit, do not go back, do not reread it. Just like, yeah, I'm writing. You could just keep writing. I don't know what to write. I don't know what to write. You could keep doing that. Or you could say, you know, whatever thoughts come in your head, put them down on the page. You do that for three full handwritten pages, single spaced, probably take you about 20 minutes and you do that for a week. I'm telling you, this is like, 
it, it it's like gold. Anytime I've ever been stuck, it it unleashes it. It's like usually what happens is all the stuff that's blocking you in the subconscious comes out on the page and you're like, oh, I was worried about this. I was worried about, you know, the bills I have to pay. I was worried that, you know, this story is going to be the worst thing I've ever written, et cetera, et cetera. You have to kind of turn off that critical brain that it, when you're, when you sit down to write and, you know, I, I, love, I love to, I love to hear about the stuff like that, te different techniques that people use to get yeah. around writer's block. And one thing that I know that when I, speaking of longhand, when I first started writing, I used to write all my stories longhand on a pad. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. it was like, and it was a psychological thing. I felt that, well, it can be crappy because I'm just writing it longhand. If I'm sitting at a computer, at a, at a, you know, at a typewriter computer, it's more official. So if, as long as it's crappy, I can just, I felt more unrestrained and could, I had permission to write crap. Um, yeah. So it, it's funny how the brain works. It's, it's, but it's the one thing I will say, cautionary tale is some people use substances to, to get over writer's block, like whether it's alcohol or THC or, or cigarettes and I think it's a really, really bad thing yes. to do heroin. that. Heroin is, is the best. Yeah, heroin. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Heroin works really okay. well. <laughs> Heroin's fine. Opium <laughs> depends. Uh, no, I, cause I, I, you know, I did that when I first started writing, like I would smoke cigarettes while I was writing. And then, you know, one day I looked down and next to me, there was this ashtray just overflowing with, with cigarette. And I was like, what the hell am I doing? This is disgusting. And, you know, I've written when I was drunk and I'm like, oh, this is so good. I'm not, you know, my subconscious is freely flowing, but you know, it's a lot, it's diminishing returns, <laughs> right? It's, so it's, it's, it's drunken writing. It's for how, I mean, that's a cliche, right? The right. writers all drink and they, maybe they do, but I, I, I would never drink while I never, no. I never write while drunk. I mean, <laughs> it's very dangerous. No, um, I just don't know if it's going to be any, I don't, I'm, I can guarantee you it would not be any good. Right. I would, I would just say, you know, treat it like, like, honestly, the best way to treat it is like an athlete, you know, sitting down, you know, you're, you're, you're doing your thing, you do it every day, you know, would you play, would you play a game drunk or stoned or, or smoking cigarettes, or would you play it like in your optimal state? Um, but yeah, I mean, th that's one way I get over blocks. Um, you know, I, I never, I'm never really short of ideas necessarily. It's, it's more of, like you said, sitting down, it's like, oh, is anyone, is anyone going to want to read this? You know, is this going to be as good as my last thing? Or, you know, I, like, I, I like to have a project to work on. I always like to have a direction. And sometimes mm -hmm. if I'm like, you know, sort of lost in the woods and don't know which direction ahead, that kind of can block me sometimes. Yeah. Um, you know, you said something interesting there, which it's like, it's a deep philosophical question that I've often thought of, which is, you know, when we sit down to write, is the idea, is is, is what's driving us to write the idea that somebody's going to be reading it? Or would you be, would you write if you knew that um, nobody, you know, you're going to put it in your drawer, let's say, nobody's ever going to look at it. Um, you know, yeah. is, is that is that part of what drives, I mean, for me, when I sit down and write, that's I'm definitely thinking, Part of the fun of it is thinking that somebody's going to read read it and enjoy it, and that's driving me to write it. Uh, so I'm always impressed by. And there are people out there who say that no, it's the act of read the creative act itself, right? That, that drives me. Uh, what was that movie that about the 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 singer the the songwriter singer who who um, was only famous? It turns out in South Africa, he had no idea he was he had he had become oh searching for sugar man searching for sugar man. Where I, I thought it, again, the documentary touched on this about Rodriguez deep question. A singer named Rodriguez, who was a complete failure here in the United States, recorded a bunch of albums, and uh, he thought he had failed. And but little unbeknownst to him, this, the albums became super popular in South Africa, where there was apartheid, and um, also I think was it Australia? So it's a couple of uh, random areas. Yeah. He never knew. He never knew that he was not only famous. He was a superstar in those countries, yeah. as big as Elvis, as big as the Beatles. And he later came to learn that. And, and what he what he said when interviewed was that's that that's not what was driving 
him to 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 do the songs. It, it, really, it was the, the the art itself, and it didn't matter to him whether people heard it, and whether he became famous. That it was the the art itself. Uh, so anyway, that was a a tangent, but um, but when yeah, you said- I mean, I'm I'm personally, I would say that. Uh, by the way, that that's a great movie, and and Rodriguez is an amazing, amazing artist. Like those albums are just like they hit me right in the feels. They're so good. Mm-hmm. Um, those songs. Yeah, uh, I I would say I'm somewhere in the middle. Like I I, I like to um, I like to imagine people reading my stuff. I don't think I would necessarily put as much work into it if it was just for myself, but I'm like, I'm always writing stories in my head, whether or not I'm putting them on the page. And I've, I've been doing that since I was a kid. Like I just, just making up stories in my head that I (laughs) entertain myself. Um, So I guess I kind of am doing it. I'm just not putting, putting it on paper. But when when I, when I, when you played with like toy soldiers, or whatever, like when you were a kid, did you have elaborate uh, stories? You know. Um, oh you, my God! I created a whole like <laughs> a whole GI Joe fortress in my basement uh, <laughs> that I took like all I took apart like uh, spiral notebooks and used them as like that as barbed wire, and I created like a zip, <laughs> a zip line, and I used like this old um, matchbox uh car like roads and made like fences with them it was yeah it was just a whole elaborate thing and yeah yeah, me too i had had toy soldiers and plastic dinosaurs and they would have battles and that would stretch on for days with very elaborate stories yeah i mean i I think that's common with a lot of writers is that we're always making up stories in our head Mm -hmm. and i i do that all the time I, i i i it's sort of a way that i entertain myself which which kind of leads me leads us to the to the next section because i feel like there are so many distractions today that i don't have as much time to daydream and entertain myself like so so i feel cuz you and i grew up in a time before cell phones before social media before you know computers were everywhere and you know you would wait online let's say a checkout line at the supermarket or you know you buy in a coffee in the morning or you know in school or whatever and you would just have to sit there and sometimes there would be long stretches of nothing and you'd have to entertain yourself at least i did so mm-hmm. i would make up stories in my head i was this your experience How, like yeah no absolutely i mean I, I never looked at it that way before i was i look i've been looking at Looking in the sort of the converse way, I was the fact that now that now you're constantly distracted by your phone. You're right. I, I hadn't thought about the fact that without the phone, I wasn't and I was able to think of ideas. But I know that now any downtime, out, out comes the phone, check your texts, check social media, check the news. You know, it just eats up all of your mind. I mean, all of your creative energy is, is um, uh, you know, you're distracted. It's 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 expended. And these uh, these various ways, and it's a real challenge. It's still, I mean, it's it's a challenge that I'm still facing. The fact that those are tremendous, tremendously tempting distractions. And is is there somebody was telling me was I think it was Teresa Delucci uh, that there is a uh, an app or something that will block your uh, internet for yeah. some periods of time. There's different apps, and and you know, there's stuff called Screen Time. But mm. I'm always suspicious of a device that's telling me to use less of it. Like I have to install an app to tell me to use fewer apps. Like, I, I don't know. This, it seems kind of, you know, snake chasing its own tail there. But um, well, how do you, how do you manage that? I mean, I think you're better at it than I am. How do you, how do you avoid the temptation of social media and the news? So I do, so- uh, you know, I'm not like a, you know, I don't use zero social media. I, I limit, I limit it. Uh, so when I'm writing, my phone is silent. I don't check. E- I generally try not to check emails before lunch. Sometimes I do. Uh, I don't read the news before before lunch. Um, and, you know, I turn I turn off my phone uh, or it's muted. Uh, and, I, you know, I have a override if my wife calls me or something. But mm-hmm. um, basically, you just shut it off and... Um, 
Yeah, I mean, so there's a book that I would highly recommend called Deep Work by Cal Newport. And he talks about this, that, you know, in our in our current age of distractions of social media, that it's so easy to just get sucked into that. And and because of that, we have we've lost the ability to focus. And then he basically develops strategies for how to rebuild that that focus. But it's it's interesting because you you walk around like I've been doing a lot of walking around Manhattan recently and everywhere, everywhere people are on their phones like they're sitting, they're, they're crossing the street, they're on their phone, they're in their cars driving, they're on their phone. Like it, you look around and it's kind of it's kind of like frightening, you know, it's like can you, can you imagine if somebody, you know, and this is a story idea, imagine if somebody from a long time ago. We're, you know, somehow now in the future and they're looking around. I mean, it, it would really look very futuristic. All of and I do it. Too. Yeah. You know, kind of like bound, enslaved to these devices, you know? Uh, um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's like, uh, yeah, it's, it's very, it's very weird. And like, people are just not aware of other people. And, and, um, you know, you hear a lot in society about this epidemic of anxiety among teenagers and, you know, uh, that people are don't have like the social skills that they once had. And, you know, young people are avoiding telephones. They don't want to talk on the phone anymore. They want to text because it's too scary. And, and these are, these are things that I find kind of really disturbing. And I know we're getting off topic a little, but mm-hmm. like I, my advice would be just put down that phone. Like you're, you're waiting in line you know you're you're at the supermarket and you're you're on the checkout line or you're you know buying a sandwich or you're you know waiting for waiting for you know you order two slices of pizza you're waiting for them to come out of the oven put down your phone just stop and look around and look at people look at the world and and like allow yourself to be bored like that's that's the thing i think we've lost is the ability to be bored we it's like you know, yeah. you don't have to be entertained every second of the day. And some people find that boredom extremely anxiety producing mm-hmm. because they've never learned how to be with themselves without anyone else around yeah. them. But I think that's where the magic is. I think the magic is in the self-reflection, is in the boredom. That's where the daydreaming begins. That's where the um the reflection begins like the reflection of yourself and the world and your relationship to it. And that's where like the greatest story ideas come from. And, you know, I would just say, allow yourself to be bored. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny how also because of social media, you know, I find it's harder for me to read like long pieces, sit down and read a book um, because I'm, I'm used to getting my information now in little short little, you know, five minute bits of information. Yeah. Uh, so that's another problem because I think a, a good source of inspiration for writers is other writing, reading, reading books. Um, so that's yet another challenge. So, you know, I would also recommend finding time to read books and that's hard in this day and age. And and you have to, I find that I have to set a time for that as well, schedule that as well, because it's so easy for me to just be like, oh, I'll, I'll read it later. And then I never do. Right. So, yeah. you you know, you were talking about reading longer works that I found that like my, my books that I was reading were getting shorter and shorter to the point. It was like, I didn't want to read like a long book. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, no, I don't, I don't like this trend that I, I can't focus. So I challenged myself, like I'm reading this, I know you can't see it at home, but this, this book is, uh, it's called you, you can't go home again by Thomas Wolfe. And it's 650 pages. I'm about halfway through. Oh, wow. Um, you know, it's long, it's long and it requires <laughs> a lot of attention and yeah. it's going to take me probably a few weeks to read it. But, uh, mm-hmm. you know, I, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying getting immersed in it and, and just like turning off everything and just reading and, and yeah, it's, it's anxiety producing. Cause in the back of my head, I'm like, Oh, I, I probably have emails and work and what's going on on social media and, and all this stuff. But you really, yeah. I think for the, the, the really good, creative stuff that you have to tune out the world for a little bit you have to just shut off everything for a little while yeah 
Well, um, you know, one last thing, uh, one last thought I'll have. I think that we're probably coming up on time, but uh, one last thought I'll, I'll, one I want to mention is that um, I, in some ways I operate differently than you um, in my writing in the sense that I tend to be very deadline driven. And, that, and it comes from the fact that I, you know, for 30 something years, 40 years, I practiced, uh, I practiced law. And, and as a result of that, I became really used to being driven by deadlines. You know, you have to file a brief on this date and mm -hmm. maybe you can get like a one week extension or something, but that's, you know, if, if it's due, it's due and you can't miss that deadline. So no matter what, you may have to pull an all nighter, but it's gotta yeah. be done. And it, be, it became over the years used to that. So I'm often looking for deadlines to drive my creative writing. And that's why, and, and that, that's why I like to volunteer stories to my writers group so that I feel like, Oh, I have a deadline. It's due Saturday. Yeah, I haven't written enough. I may have to pull an all-nighter, but it'll get done. Um, and I'm in that situation at this moment. <laughs> yeah, I promised, I, I promised the story to the group, so it's due tomorrow at midnight. So it's gonna it's gonna be done because I promised it. Uh, but um, so you know, it'll it'll get done. I'm about sixty five percent of the way through, and I've outlined outlined it so I know where it's going. So it'll get done. It'll get done. But I don't think you you don't write. Some people will say no that. That creates anxiety. I cannot write that way. Um, I way mean, I, I can if I have to. If someone's like, I need it by this date. Um, mm -hmm. I actually have something due next week that I haven't started. Uh, it's, <laughs> well, only 600, it's only 600 <laughs> words. But uh, okay. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I think finding what what motivates you. So, you know, every, every writer is different. Every, every writer is going to have their own preferences and things that work for them. If you're a beginning writer, I would say try them all and see what works for you. Mm -hmm. um, so like you you like deadlines. And and me, I think it's more of, I like to have an end goal. So it's like, oh, I want to write this story about X and then I'm going to send it to this market or the, you know this editor um, or I always wanted to write a story about this and then that kind of motivates me or I want to write a novel and that, that motivates me. Like I, I, I need to have like a direction, like a, 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 um, a goal, an end goal in mind. And that's motivating enough for me. Um, because it's like, okay, I, I, you know, I, I sit down at the page and like, okay, I, I'm working towards this goal. Even if I only do 500 words today, I'm, I'm moving towards that goal. That's kind of what motivates me. Yeah. Yeah. And different writers, as you say, they also work at different speeds and they have different output. Um, you know, Stephen King is very prolific. And, you know, somebody like Ted Chang, um, who's a fantastic short story writer, he's not that prolific. He comes out with a couple of gems, you know, once a year, maybe. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So it depends, as, of, as is often the case in writing it. <laughs> It depends on the individual, but these are some broad ideas that I'm glad we were able to, to talk through. So, yeah. So, so uh, yeah. If anyone listening has any thoughts on writer's block, inspiration, procrastination, motivation, uh, put down your, put down your cell phones and let us know. <laughs> yeah. Put down your, put down your cell phones and let us know on social media. Wait a minute. Uh, <laughs> No, um, where can where can they find where can folks find you, Dave? Uh, what's the best way to, Just to Google get it? Google Mercurio de Rivera, and my my web page will come up with my email address. Yeah, and, um, yeah I think that we we both are pretty findable. With our names on, on just Google us. Yeah, because uh, I, I I feel like there's a lot more we could say about this, and you know. I want to hear what other people's techniques are. Like you said, I'm I'm always interested in other people's, uh, you know, writing habits. I, I find it interesting. Yeah, I mean, um, I've, heard, I've heard so many different. I've heard some writers say, "Well, look, I have to change the location of my writing. I need to maybe point my desk towards the window one day, and so to get new ideas." <laughs> I'm like, I've yeah. never heard that before. How interesting that that works for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. Anyway. Well, this has been uh, it's been great. I'm, I'm a little bit anxious. Yeah. I haven't checked my I haven't checked my email or my social media. In, uh, I know. Gotta get so. gotta get back on. I'm very stressed. Yeah, blue sky. <laughs> um, 
All right. Well, this has been fun. So uh, I'm Matt Kressel here with uh, Mercurio D. Rivera. And uh, thanks for, uh, for tuning in. We'll see you in the next episode. And we, we'll, we'll leave you with two words. What is it? Farewell. Oh, wait. <laughs> Let's do Matt, it again. I screwed it up. I screwed it up. I screwed it up. Like, clock up. Like, like clockwork. All right. Ready? Is, all right. Three, two, one. Farewell. Farewell. Nerds. All right. We got to get better at that. All right. <laughs> <laughs> see you in the next step. All right. See you, Matt. See you. You've been listening to the Nerd Count Podcast. That's our show. But if you want more shows, check us out at nerdcountpodcast.com or your favorite podcasting site. See you next time. Get those nerds! Nerd!